Brenda Janowitz is the author of seven novels, including The Grace Kelly Dress. She is the former books correspondent for Pop Sugar, and her work was also appeared in the New York Times, Real Simple, The Washington Post, and The New York Post, among others. She's a graduate of Cornell University and Hofstra School of Law and lives in New York with her husband and two sons. The author of 18 New York Times bestsellers and 19 USA Today bestsellers, Jane Green is a former journalist in the UK and a graduate of the International Culinary Center in New York. Some of her many novels include The Beach House, Falling, The Sunshine Sisters, and she has a published cookbook, Good Taste. She also has a book available for pre-order, Sister Stardust, and links will be sent in the chat for that, as well as one of her other books, The Friends We Keep. We are so excited to have them both here tonight, so I'm going to pass things off to them so they can get us started. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Jeez. Hi. We're here. We're here. And, and we have 80 people with us, which is kind of extraordinary. There you are. OK, I had to change my view here. Um, Brenda, thank you. So I'm so happy to be here. And I love these virtual events. It's kind of amazing how many people you can you can squeeze onto a computer screen. <laughs> um, I would love to start by asking you to tell us a little bit about the Liz Taylor ring because I'm I'm presuming you have your elevator pitch down and I think the author tells the story better than anyone else so can you tell us about um, the story of the Liz Taylor ring? Thank you. Well first I just have to say I'm so excited to be here with you tonight. I was with you in March 2020 before the global pandemic began. We were in person in your hometown. And I kind of thought that my two books would bookend the pandemic, but alas. <laughs> well, I'm getting there, I think. But we're still here. So thank you yeah. so much for doing this. I'm so excited to see you, even if it's only across the screen and not in person. So let me tell everyone about the Liz Taylor ring. So it is the story of three siblings, their parents' epic love affair and the one diamond thought to be long lost that is rediscovered and it threatens to sort of crash the family down to the ground. <laughs> you know, after finishing the Grace Kelly dress, I really wanted to write about another family heirloom. I had so much fun talking about this idea of what belonged to what person, who belongs to what, to sort of who, who whom, um, that I wanted to do it again. And when I think about heirlooms, I always think about my grandma Dorothy's rings, which today I'm wearing my Krupp replica ring that my mother bought for me. But on most days, I wear one of my grandma Dorothy's rings and depending on how important the day is or the event is, sometimes I'm wearing all three. And they're so meaningful to me. There's just something about heirlooms, I think, that is so special. It sort of can make you think of the person who gave it to you, you can sort of feel their spirit with you. Um, so I knew I wanted my next book about heirlooms to be about jewelry. And since I love my grandmother's rings so much, I said, well, it's gotta be rings. So once I narrowed that part down, I figured I wanna do another Hollywood starlet. And when you're talking jewelry, there's really on only one Hollywood starlet that comes to mind and that is Elizabeth Taylor. So that's sort of how I came up with the idea uh, and then beyond that, I knew I wanted it to be a family drama because in the Grace Kelly dress, we had three generations and the dress was passed down. I decided instead for the Liz Taylor ring, I would have three siblings and they were all gonna fight over it. <laughs> so a little bit different, a little more dramatic and just sort of tackling something different about family dynamics, saying something different about families, the way family story is sort of told and passed down. That was one of the things I really wanted to do with this book. Um, um, oh, were you about to? Well, there, there are just, there are so many questions I want to ask you about this book, which is, it is, I think what I, what really struck me, I mean, I, and, and I did blurb it and, and you do write with tremendous heart and, and, but what really struck me reading this for the second time, which I, I did in preparation for this, was how propulsive it is 
um, that it, it just, it clips along and it's very clever and, and you, the pace changes, you know, as, as it ramps up, suddenly, you know, you reach a point when you sort of realize you're racing through the pages to get, and, and I thought it was done so cleverly and, and was that deliberate? Did you think about, were you quite deliberate in the plotting and the pacing of this? I really, really was. And first, I just have to take a moment to remind readers how much I love you and how I've been reading your books since before I was a writer. And you are one of the writers. I was just talking to Chicklet Central today about how you were one of the writers who inspired me. Reading your books, um, starting with Jemima J back in the day, it really, it spoke to me and it said, oh, you know, you can have a voice that's authentic to yourself. So I feel like I learned a lot from you. <laughs> oh, Brenda, I'm actually, I'm actually tearing up. Thank you. I, thank you. <laughs> <sighs> Everyone knows how much I love Jane Green, especially, you should know that too. Well, so, you know, with this book, yes, it was very deliberate. I really wanted to create a page turner and something that people sort of couldn't put down. And when I started the book, you know, I used a little trick in the Grace Kelly dress where I ended every chapter with sort of a cliffhanger. Yeah. I did that manipulative little trick where it's like, well, now you have to keep reading because yeah. I've got to do the mystery. So I did a little less of that with this book. But at a certain point, I said to myself, okay, but what's keeping the reader reading? So I always had that in the back of my mind because you know, the world being the way it is today, even though a lot of us are at home, people still have less time. And people, when they pick up a book, it's hard to sort of keep their attention. And so I always was thinking about that. And with this book in particular, I sort of wrote a first draft in sort of like a COVID fever dream. Like my kids were home, we were sort of in full quarantine and I just sort of wrote and wrote and wrote. And then after that, I sat down and I created an outline and I said, okay, what should be where? So the work on this book was sort of backwards. Like I wouldn't recommend that any writer do it this way, but that's just what worked for this book. I sort of free wrote the whole thing and then I sort of put it back together again, keeping in mind, how do we keep readers reading? Especially when it came to the parts about the ring. Yeah. These guys were moving. I was constantly moving those around with that goal in mind. Oh, and were you thinking, because one of the things that I know I talk about, I find myself talking about with other authors a lot of the time is how none of us have any attention span anymore. And, and you know, and actually, I mean, I find it hard to read these days. I don't read any, I don't read in the way that I used to. And, and so I wondered about that because I, you know, your chapters are short with the cliffhanger and and I know that I've read that there are authors who have sort of deliberately changed their writing to shorten their chapters because of, of this lack of attention span so so was that something that you you had thought about? I mean yes and no I happen to love books with short chapters so I always tend to write in these shorter clips because I also want the scene to be really tight so I'm always editing down and I think what I've learned with these last two books especially is that you can't be afraid to cut. I think mm -hmm. I used to be, especially on my first novel, it was like, no, 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 don't cut that, I wrote that. You know what that's called, by the way? It's called Killing Your Darlings. It's <laughs> well, Killing I'm, Your Darlings. You can't be, you, you mustn't be afraid to kill your darlings, yeah. I didn't do that for the longest time. And then I really, with Grace and now with Liz, I really leaned into uh, writing is rewriting. And yeah. I just wasn't afraid to cut and rewrite. And, you know, I find when you rewrite these scenes, sometimes, you know, the characters better, you know what you're trying to say in that chapter better. So the rewrite's always better anyway. So I just wasn't as scared, I think. Um, so what, yeah, what number book is this? This is number seven, lucky number seven, which is yeah. fitting because it's about a gambler. <laughs> yeah, that, that is, it's so interesting. I, I often think that when we first start, you know, we're very precious about our writing and, and heaven forbid, you know, it, it's sometimes hard to even take advice from an editor, but actually the longer you're in this business, the more you realize the, the what, I mean, you just can't do it without somebody you trust and who you listen to. You have to actually have the humility to listen to somebody and, and trust that it's right to cut and then you, you learn how to do it yourself. 
Yeah, you know, it's so tricky. Originally in this book, I had an entire timeline happening in 1969, which was the first time Lizzie and Richie met when Lizzie was a kid. And my editor was like, I don't think you need all this, but it was like five or six chapters. It was a lot. And um, I was so afraid to cut it. And I just said to her, you know, her way is she does a few rounds of edits. So I knew there were a few bites at the apple. I said, how about we just leave it in for now? And she was like, okay, fine, but just keep it in the back of your mind. Mm. And so I did. And as I was editing, I remember it was over break because the kids were home. <laughs> I took a nap. And when I woke up, it was like a light bulb. And I was like, I need to cut 1969. <laughs> and I texted her and I was like, I just woke up from a nap and it turns out you were right. And she was like, okay. <laughs> she didn't say I told you so. <laughs> that you wake up from your naps and you get these brains and they're like exactly the right thing I wake up from my naps thinking oh my god and then the next day I'm like what was I thinking actually it's usually in the middle of the night I wake up and I'm like what the hell was I thinking so. well I mean that happens too of course but whenever I edit I keep two documents so I save everything in case I cut too much and in fact the book I'm working on now I think that that happened I think I was so cut happy that I cut something I actually needed. So thankfully I have it saved. <laughs> yes, no, I, I also have an outtake document just in case, although I, I so rarely go back to it. In fact, I mean, with Sister Star, with, you know, this new one, I, I didn't go back to it at all. Um, it, I, I was really, I mean, this is a, this is a complex book. There is a lot happening and, and layered storylines and back and forth and, very easy to follow as a reader but as a writer I have to say I mean I I was in awe um I I don't know how you do I'd love to hear about the process of of plotting because it, it's just so convoluted how do you plot a book like this it was so incredibly difficult and I think the answer is I didn't really plot it I had a general sense of what I was trying to say with the book and there are a few things that I sort of lay out in the beginning of the book that I wanted to sort of bring through. So I knew a lot of things that I wanted to happen, but I didn't know how I was going to get there. And it takes place over so many decades that I wasn't even sure what I would show of each part of these relationships. So like I said, I free wrote a lot of it and I just had a general sense of beginning, middle and end, but I didn't know what the exact ending would be yeah. I just sort of had a sense and I knew I wanted it to be heartwarming and somewhat happy. So I did a first draft, but that's when I realized all sort of the mistakes. <laughs> so I think at that point I went back and I created a timeline starting when Richie and Lizzie were born. So I started those years and then I went through just figuring out when people would be born, when they were getting married, when they'd be in high school, just all the things that I was talking about, like when that happened. There's a third sibling who's born years later. When was she born? Uh, so I created this master document that was a timeline. That's what I was going to ask you. Do you do you have a whiteboard or index cards or no? It's just a document on your computer. Yeah. I mean, I wish I could be one of those writers who had like a really cool whiteboard or yeah. corkboard and they were moving things around, but that just never works for me. I always try to do that thing with the index cards and lay it out on the floor and I just can't that's just not how my brain works so this was just a running document but the funny thing is that I think you'll appreciate because a lot of writers are not that good at math I had done some of the math wrong <laughs> so at one point my editor was like this age is wrong and I went and yeah. I was like what's she talking about I have a timeline and then I looked at the timeline and it was like you know you did the math wrong even with yeah. a calculator <laughs> so I sort of had to fix that but then everything sort of fell into place so once I had the timeline that really helped but I wanted lots of things to be true and lots of family stories to be happening at the same time because that's sort of what the book is about family lore and how it changes over time and how it changes as different people tell it um just sort of like real life like when you tell a story what I was going to say earlier, I'm working on an article for um, Real Simple, which is about an heirloom in my husband's family. So I did the first draft of this essay just from my memory when I joined the family 14 years ago. And, you know, so it's based on what Doug told me, what my mother-in-law told me, what my two sisters-in-law told me. And then I had my mother-in-law and my husband read it and they were like, no, this is wrong, this is wrong. And then there were parts where my mother-in-law and Doug 
didn't have the same memory of it. <laughs> so that's sort of what the book is about though, right? That these family stories change. Everything is sort of true. What my mother-in-law thinks is true, what Doug thinks is true, it's all sort of true. It's their perception. So I was trying to sort of make that happen. It definitely got tricky. And so that's why after the first draft, I created a master outline. And I know you've taken screenwriting classes also, right? You've taken these classes yeah. where you learn about different ways to structure. So I laid it out in an eight sequence structure. And I, I don't know if that, that if you took a class. Explain, explain to us what that means. So, I mean, essentially every book is beginning, middle and end. You yeah. could simplify it and say every book is three acts. But then if you break it down further, a screenwriter might say, no, it's actually four acts because act two is divided in the middle by a midpoint. So now you've got four acts. <laughs> so the eight sequence structure, the idea is you take those four acts and then you break them down further into eight acts. And uh, am I correct I'm, in thinking that the midpoint is usually a plot twist? It's a, it's the unexpected thing in, yeah, in the Something middle of that unexpected too. And someone unexpected appears in my book at the midpoint. And, you know, in film classes, they'll fight over the midpoint. The midpoint isn't necessarily the exact midpoint of your book. Um, hopefully it's somewhat near the middle. I remember my editor, she knows how I work like this. So she'd be reading it on a Kindle and she'd be like, this is 60%, not 50. <laughs> but you, you want the flow of the book to feel like in the middle of the book, like that, oh my goodness moment. Um, so, but yeah, the midpoint, um, in one of my classes, they called it the midpoint turnaround because sometimes it can completely flip the action and turn everything on its head. Uh, so that's sort of what I did in this book. So that's how I plotted it out. And then once I was figuring my eight sequences out, that's where I figured out my chapters and where things were going to fall. And what are, what are, what classes did you do? What classes have you done? Oh my God. So, so many. So oh, really? Wow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I haven't, I think I took one over quarantine. I mean, not as many lately, but um, the class that I'm referring to was a class by um, Alexandra Sokoloff, who is a screenwriter and also a novelist. So she teaches a class that's for novelists using screenwriting tricks. Okay. And she's the one where I really learned eight, eight sequence structure. Uh, but I've taken other classes like with Gotham Writers Workshop, I've taken a screenwriting, a playwriting, and I think all those things are great because you pick up different tips and you learn from different, uh, different ways of doing it and you can sort of apply that to your novel writing. Novel writing is completely different because you could read a book with like literally no structure and still yeah. love it. But I do find that the books that I love and the books where the plot moves quickly, they are working with some sort of structure. Do you think it's also because we write commercial fiction, we're much more cognizant of plot? I think if you're a literary writer, you're just sort of lost in the dreaminess of the words. But as a commercial writer, you want it to be well written. You want to be proud of, of what you write. But, but plot is, is really important and more important because actually with the way the world has changed, everybody now in the publishers, everybody wants something that could be possibly film or TV. And uh, absolutely, that's plot driven. Yeah, you know, I talk to writer friends about this all the time. It's always the sort of push and pull, how important plot is and how important the things that we sort of hold dear character and like the little nitty gritty pieces of writing. And the truth is, I do think a lot of writers, a lot of readers are just reading for plot. Every once in a while, I'm sure you've had this happen. Someone recommends a book and you're like, that book was horrible. <laughs> what on earth are you talking about? And you'll talk to the person and they just like it had a twist at the end or it sort of kept the pages turning on a beach. So, you know, to me that says people really want plot. So I do think you have to focus on it, like you said, when as we're writing commercial fiction. Um, but you need the other stuff too. Yeah, right? yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, what I loved that your knowledge of things like gambling. I, I mean, I was reading this thinking, are you just a really, really, I mean, are, are you really good at pulling the wool over my eyes? And I think you're this sort of lovely, you know, right from house, but actually, are you in casinos like five nights a week gambling? Because it, it felt like you really, really knew it. And I don't know whether you do or whether you just did huge research, but I was impressed. 
you know, when I started writing this book, I, <laughs> this is going to sound funny. Everyone, once you read the book, you'll find this funnier and Jane's going to find this funny now. When I was writing it, I didn't realize people would be asking me about gambling quite this much, but so far I've been asked about it nonstop. <laughs> I used to love to gamble. Oh, I, well, there you go. Okay, it comes across. I mean, it comes across that you, uh, I, you really, it comes across that you really know what you're talking about. I really do. And <gasps> What's your game? I mean, I don't, I love craps, which I think you'll, you, you know, that's obvious from that scene. I, I love being in a casino, sort of the energy, the juice, like all of it. Um, yeah, you know, there was a time when I was turning 21 that I was in casinos like all the time. I don't gamble quite as much anymore, especially being married with kids. I want to spend my money on different things. But a few years back, Doug and I went to a charity night and it was a casino night. And I, you know, it was for a good cause. And so we bought all these chips. And I remember we got to the table and my friends were like, what is happening <laughs> because it was like a, a new brenda it was gambler brenda no, you're, the, you're the ringer <laughs> all the husbands were sort of like what's going on it was a <laughs> table full of men and me and one of the husbands was like doug do you like this do you find this sexy or are you freaking out are you scared of your wife right now he's like i love it and we had a blast and we just dominated the craps tables all night long it was for a good cause you know but um it's okay, even if it was for a bad cause, I, it's a great <laughs> story. Um, I, and then the other thing that I wanted to ask you about, just because I found it so fascinating, is that one of, the, one of the daughters in this story is a sugar baby. And she gets this, this sort of old creaky, but completely divine, like this sort of Hamish or sugar daddy, who's like the grandpa that you've always wanted. Um, but so tell me about, tell me about that research. Yeah. So she, I mean, first of all, she lucked out, right? She, she got a I was going to say, does that actually happen that you get yourself like an, an, an 87 year old bazillionaire who lends you his jet and doesn't want to have sex with you? You know, I don't know. Although someone recently told me um, that everyone in college has a sugar daddy, that it's like a very common thing that lots of women have sugar daddies. But in terms of my research, it started because when I joined Instagram, for some reason, I was getting all these people sending me messages asking me if I wanted to be a sugar baby, which I found bizarre because wouldn't you want a young person to be your sugar baby? No, <laughs> I mean, can you pass them on to me? I'd really like a sugar daddy. Really, especially if I don't have to, you know, do anything for it. But well, the whole thing, it became so comical because some weeks I'd be getting requests and they'd be saying, I'll give you $5,000 a week. And then some weeks. What? Would... Hold on, but for what? what? Conversation. For real? Is that actually? No, they're not for, I mean, I assume they were like, just give me your checking information. <laughs> I assume that sort of, I assume they were. Oh, all... this is give us, give us your bank account details and then we'll just basically bleed you dry. That's right. Right. But the funniest part, sometimes I would get them and they were like, oh, I'll give you a hundred dollars a week. And I was like, a hundred? Last week I could have yeah. got it. Like, Who do you think you're talking to? It became a thing where I started posting them. And then the more I posted and made fun of it in my stories, the more I got somehow. Were you hashtagging? Hashtag sugar baby. Yeah, hashtag course. sugar daddy. Hashtag available. Um, hashtag no sex though husband wouldn't be happy <laughs> it was like hashtag too old to be a sugar yeah. baby <laughs> okay by the way I'm sorry I'm gonna just completely change the subject for two seconds but I just posted this thing I found a screenshot there was some new app which was chatting with strangers like all over the world and all the kids were using it and I was bored one night and I decided to try it and some guy somewhere was like and they do like age, sex, whatever. And, it, and he was like, age, sex, and it was like age. And I went 47, I was 47 at the time. And he went, no, really. And I went, no, really, I'm 47, gone, <laughs> gone. It was very funny, it made me laugh. Yeah, anyway, sorry. Um, so, but what is the difference between being a sugar baby and, I mean, is there a difference? Is it? I mean, it's tricky. It's it's really tricky. At the time when I was writing the Courtney character, I was I read a few books about it. I was reading a lot online about it, and 
it seems like, I, I mean, I never, honestly, I never really could figure out what the nuance was that sort of made it different than just straight up prostitution. But a lot of these women, it seems, are going out with people and there's no sex maybe at first. So at first the arrangement is just sort of like hanging out. But then I also was told that some people are just going as dates. So then it becomes more of like an escort situation where someone maybe needs someone for work dinners and stuff. And that's how it begins. Um, but I was never able to figure out the nuance of sort of what was going on. Um, wow. And what the difference I, was. You know, if anybody needs a date, you know, an English woman, quite good conversation, <laughs> quite fun. Um, no sex though, just Jane and Jane Queen. Um, so, so thank you for, for shedding a little bit of light on that. I, I think I have to go down, I have to go down the sugar daddy, sugar baby rabbit hole, just because I find the whole thing fascinating. Um, now, obviously we know that there's a Liz Taylor theme because it's called the Liz Taylor ring. Um, I didn't know until I got to the very end. And I sort of love that you do this actually, that, that it's also subtle that you don't realize the amount of research, well, either the, the amount of knowledge that you have because you you love old Hollywood or the amount of research that you did and you do do a, a, a full bibliography. But it, was Elizabeth Taylor a particular passion for you or was it just that she fitted the bill for the jewelry and did you become obsessed? I mean, yes and yes. I've always loved Elizabeth Taylor ever since- she, She's your favorite? You know, I really think I've done Grace Kelly and now I'm doing Elizabeth Taylor and next I'll do Audrey Hepburn. I think those are three of my favorites. Okay. I also have a fourth, but I'm not sure if I'll do a fourth book. Who's the fourth? Can you guess? She's more Liz than Grace and Audrey. That's my hint. Well, no, because I get my own, like, I'd, I'd say Raquel Welsh, but Ju what? Ju Diamonds. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> oh, of course, of course. That's my yeah. other obsession. Yeah. You know, I think that these were the women in the movies that were on on Sundays in black and white when mm -hmm. I was a kid that I used to watch. So, you know, on Sundays I would watch them sometimes with my mom, sometimes on my own. And I just sort of fell in love with these movies. I was obsessed with the fact that they were sort of like so different from sort of what I was seeing at the time. And they were just so beautiful and so elegant and so graceful and the clothing was just to die for. And I just sort of fell in love with this whole sort of time period. Liz Taylor in particular, I watched suddenly last summer as a kid and I was like traumatized for life because it is about a woman who spends a summer with her cousin. And when she comes home, she's so disturbed by what she saw that her cousin's mother, her aunt, has her institutionalized and then is trying to get her lobotomized. <laughs> so this is one of the movies I watched as a kid that really sort of like... I can understand why that stayed with you, yeah. And I couldn't understand why Catherine Hepburn wanted to lobotomize beautiful Liz Taylor. She was so wonderful. I couldn't figure out the problem. Then in the end, you find out the deep, dark secret. And the whole thing is just so out of control and um, I just fell in love. I was so obsessed. So I, you know, I saw more Elizabeth Taylor stories and actually this is kind of funny. Recently, I was joking about Halloween and someone suggested I dress up as Elizabeth Taylor and it reminded me, I actually had dressed up as Elizabeth Taylor. When I was in law school, I had a Halloween party and I dressed up as Elizabeth Taylor in Cleopatra full gold dress, the wig, the makeup, everything. So, you know, my obsession goes back pretty far, but I only sort of knew what I knew about Elizabeth Taylor. So obviously I did research for the book. So once I started the first biography, it was so interesting. I wanted to read the next. And then I just sort of couldn't stop. And then I became more obsessed. Then I rewatched the movies and it's so interesting rewatching these old movies as an adult movies that you saw as a kid, maybe you didn't fully understand what was going on. Watching them as an adult, you just have this completely different um, idea of what's going on. So that was really interesting to me. Certain movies hold up, certain others really don't. Well, uh, the pacing is also very different in the old movies. It's fascinating watching fascinating. watching those old movies. So we're so used to everything happening so fast now. And, and these are, we, we went to see a screening of 
of was it hard it was one of the paul newman movies and it was it, cool hand luke and it I mean, it was fantastic but it was like god it was it was the it was slow you had to settle in and just just you know accept that there was going to be no screens no phones no nothing for a long time oh yeah yeah Every, everything's so different about those movies even yeah. though their shot is different yeah and, but do you do you do things to wish did she sort of inhabit your your you know do we were you waking up at night and thinking about her yeah, I mean, I became I became more obsessed. The more I learned about her, the more I sort of loved about her. Yeah, you know, there were certain things like, for example, I didn't know that she was the first celebrity to ever go to Betty Ford and be public about it and tell people she was going to Betty Ford. And when you think about the fact that she did that at that time when it wasn't acceptable, is so courageous and brave and. I think that maybe at the time people were making fun of her, like, look, she has this alcohol problem, when in fact, the opposite is true. What a brave woman. Yeah. First of all, she's admitting that she had a problem. But second of all, she's enabling other people to be honest with their truth. Mm -hmm. And I, I was just saying this the other day that I think you can draw a direct line from her being honest about her problems with alcohol to the way we view mental health right now. Right now, the way we are looking at mental health issues is so different than when you and I grew up when things were shameful and now things have come out in the open. And I think you can draw this direct line. Women like that who were so brave, who were so willing to say, this is, this is me and that's okay. Um, and now people being more open about their struggles with alcoholism or mental health. I mean, she was the first one to put herself out there. So things like that just sort of blew my mind. And um, God, so I fell more in love um, with her. Have, have you, so I, I have to ask, I mean, have you ever considered doing true historical fiction and I, going back into, into that, into her world or, or the world of, you know, whoever it is, but really immersing yourself in that time period? I have, because I've also read a lot of this biographical fiction where it's, about the person and then you take on the voice of that person but I'd always sort of be too nervous to do something like that to sort of speak in the voice of Elizabeth Taylor and well but then you can get around it by as, as I did with mine you, you have a fictitious protagonist who is in their world and that way they're sort of an, an observer let's not tease people let's tell people a little bit about sister stardust which i loved so much well do you know there's also i realize a, a little connection here two things first of all elizabeth taylor was born in Hampstead in london which is where i grew up um and uh the other thing is that elizabeth taylor's daughter former daughter-in-law was eileen getty who was married to uh, Christopher Wilding, Michael Wilding's son. And she had, tragically, because the Gettys have so, uh, my book is all about the Gettys, but she had an extramarital affair and in 1985 and contracted HIV. Mm. Um, and, and of course her marriage broke up, um, but Elizabeth Taylor was unbelievably supportive and the two of them together, just raised so much money and awareness and and for HIV and, and Eileen Getty is is I think thriving today um but yes so there is a, a Getty Elizabeth Taylor connection um incredible oh I love yeah. that you know yeah. my son's seventh grade class learned about AIDS recently and so of course I said to him, well, did you learn about Elizabeth Taylor and the work that she's done? And he was like, mom, if you email my teacher to tell him about Elizabeth Taylor, I will kill you. So I will never know if the children of the seventh grade class learned about Elizabeth Taylor's work. <laughs> oh, that's really fun. Isn't it terrible? It, it's, you know, these stars that for us are still so important. And these people that we grew up with and for our children, they just, they have, they have no idea. I mean, I live in Westport, Connecticut, which is where Paul Newman lived. And, you know, you would see him around town all the time. And, and um, for my kids, you know, he was the guy on the, on the, the, um, what's called like the pasta sauce thing for a while you know he was Newman's own but 
they, you know, they know that this generation coming out have no idea of these old movie stars and oh my god, I've just I'm suddenly realizing how old I am. <laughs> I'm just making myself feel very, very old. Um that's heartbreaking to me because when I rewatched Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, I felt like I had to watch it. You know how they watch um, an eclipse with a little hole in the paper? That's how gorgeous Paul Newman was. It hurt my eyes to look at him and to look at Elizabeth Taylor. They're both just so incredibly gorgeous. Yeah. You have to look through a pinhole. <laughs> yeah. No, and it was also, I think there was, there was a... There was a magic to them because we didn't know everything about them and 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 so the mystique and magic and the aura around these movie stars i mean we just we just don't have that today um okay i'm gonna go light for a little bit um what for you is because i when i first met you you were the books editor at, at pop sugar um and what would you say now as, as a writer, what's the best thing about being a writer? And then what's the worst? Actually, no, I'm going to reverse it. What's, should, I'm going to reverse it. So then we're left with the best, which is better. What's the, what's the hardest thing about being a writer? Oh God, you know, I think this part, actually, when the book comes out, you know, you spend so much time alone. It's just you and your computer and you're sort of alone with the material and alone with the book and you're falling in love with it. This is the point at which it's like your baby has to fly, right? It no longer belongs to you, it belongs to the readers. And there's something so difficult about that because we're such sensitive creatures. So you could read 10 reviews that are amazing. And then the one blog who's, oh, I, I hated it. The characters were unlikable or whatever they didn't like about the book, you decide that that's the one thing that's true. And those 10 people who loved it, oh, they, they, they must have missed it. But this person has discovered that you're really an idiot. So, you know, this part, it's hard. It's great because you get to come out and do things like this and speak with readers and see your writer friends. But there's something so hard about your work being out there. It's sort of like being a parent, right? I mean, it's like your heart is out there in the world and yeah. people can just feel free to stomp on it if they want. Uh, so to me, that's the worst part. It's just so incredibly hard. And also the publicity and marketing I find to be so hard because so much of it is out of your control, right? But the best part, you know, it's funny. I used to say, I used to love that Dorothy Parker quote, I hate writing, I love having written. Yeah. But what I realized during the pandemic is that I actually love writing. I love the writing. I love being alone with just all these crazy thoughts. And even the blank page, as scary as it is, I love that part where you're free writing and you're just, who knows, who cares? I can delete it tomorrow. There's something so therapeutic about it. And I feel like through COVID, writing really saved me. It was the thing I needed to do. And I was so fortunate to be on a book deal and sort of have to keep writing. Um, so writing, I feel like is sort of my salvation. So to me, that's the best part. Um, oh, the, just thank you. Part. I love that. And Victoria is back. Which yes, I am. Yes, we have some audience questions coming in. Just want to remind everyone that it's not too late to send in yours. So feel free to send in your questions using the Q&A. But I'm just going to jump right in here. So our first question is, do you listen to music when you write? Maybe music from the time that you're writing about? Ooh, I love that question. I don't. I actually don't. I like either quiet when I'm writing or lots of ambient noise, like in a coffee shop or now it would be with my kids just running around fighting and whatnot. I, I don't listen to music because I get so into the lyrics um, that I get unfocused. But I'm actually curious how Jean's going to answer this because Sister Stardust is her first book in a different time period. So I'm actually really curious. I know you immersed yeah, yourself. Yeah, I'm still immersed. I think I'm going to be immersed for the rest of my life, actually. I think this is how my true, my true um, persona is that that can't possibly be my true, um, be truthful. But anyway, um, I used to not be able to listen to anything with lyrics either because it was too distracting. Um, and 
Uh, but I would always bring if because I I've always written in libraries actually or, or or little writing rooms and so there there is I I can't write with noise around so I've always had those great big Bose noise cancelling headphones and I've always listened to sort of ambient music like a lot of study music or or, or just instrumental or classical a lot of Bach um, but with Sister Stardust it I it was. It was Rolling Stones, it, and it was the music that I grew up with because I was born in 1968, and Sister Stardust starts in 1966, and and it was I, and I played that music constantly, and it just got me in the mood, and 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 there is something for me. I was not a Rolling Stones fan. Uh, I knew very little about them. I wasn't that interested. And I hadn't realized that in writing about Talita and Paul Getty, and she was the, the very beautiful um, wife of the son of the richest man in the world um, in the 60s. And together they bought a palace in Marrakesh and restored it. And it was at the time of counterculture and the North African hippie trail. So anyone who was anyone would stop at the Gettys on their way to, to, to the North African hippie trail from, you know, Mick Jagger and Marianne Faithful to Gore Vidal to William S. Burroughs. In fact, um, somebody wrote uh, in their diaries that they went to their inaugural New Year's Eve party in 1967 and Paul Lennon, Paul McCartney and John Lennon were so stoned they couldn't get off the floor. They were just flat on their backs on the floor all night. And they had these crazy parties which from the outside, you know, Vogue was writing about Mrs. Getty all the time and her bohemian style. She was a muse of Yves Saint Laurent. But of course, behind closed doors, what nobody was seeing was that they were diving into first opium addiction and then heroin addiction and these wild orgiastic parties. It, you couldn't, they were, they had to be finite. You can't actually live like that. And it all ended in, in terrible tragedy with Talita um, dying of a heroin overdose when she was 30. Um, and uh, so, but I, what I hadn't realized was that the Rolling Stones, the Rolling Stones were there all the time. Mick Jagger and Marianne Faithful were great friends. And then there was this love triangle between Brian Jones, who was the founder of the Rolling Stones, was with Anita Pallenberg for years. And they decided to take a car ride down to Tangier, down to Morocco. And they hid drugs in all these secret compartments in, in Keith Richards's Bentley S3 con uh, Continental called the Blue Lena. And they hid drugs everywhere. And Brian Jones got terribly sick with pneumonia. So they dropped him off at a hospital in France, carried on to Morocco. And of course it was Keith Richards and Anita Pallenberg in the back of a Rolls Royce with fur rugs, lots of music, lots of booze, lots of drugs. And they all fell madly in love. But there was this like terrible triangle. And I really, I, I, I just thought the story of that was fascinating. And that really drove this, the story of Sister Stardust. Um, but anyway, that's, so that's me. That's Sister Stardust. I've done it now. I've told, it's available for pre-order pre coming out on April the 5th. And it's fantastic. I loved it. Thank you. Okay. What are some of the biggest changes you've seen in your writing since COVID? If any. Oh, goodness, so many, so many. Um, you know, when, when COVID first started, I was still on book tour for the Grace Kelly dress. And so I thought it would be finite. It was at the time when my book tour got canceled, it was like, oh, we'll just do these two weeks or three weeks and then everything will go back to normal. So I think for a long time that spring, I kept waiting for things to get back to normal. And then um, closing in on the summer, I realized I, who knows what normal is, when it's coming, I just have to get back to the writing. And that's when I realized I really needed to write. It was helping my mental state. It was making me feel like myself again. It was making me so happy to just write every morning. And I would write a thousand words a day at least, sometimes more. And um, yeah, that's, that's when things changed, when I realized I actually love the actual writing part and not the having written part. So for me, um, yeah, a lot, a lot of things changed, I think. I, I, I have to jump in and say I had such a similar experience that I, I also always loved the having written rather than the writing. And COVID coincided with me becoming an empty nester. 
And so I'd always been enormously disciplined about my writing and it was the mornings because that was the that was my free time when the kids were in school and I'd go off to the library and then I'd be done by lunchtime and I'd meet a friend for and I'd be mum in the afternoon. And all of a sudden during COVID and with the kids not being home, the days got very, very long. But what it meant was I didn't have to cram my writing into three hours and just like, oh, I've got to get it down, I've got to go. It, I, ha I now have the luxury of I can write all day and all night if I feel like it and there are no time and also who has plans we don't go out with anyone I mean it but it, it what it's meant is that I'm much more deliberate about the writing um, and I think I'm I'm I think it shows okay what was the most surprising thing you learned about Elizabeth Taylor? Oh gosh, I mean, so many things. Um, a lot of things were surprises. A lot of times when I go into these things and I start researching, I feel like I know everything, right? Because I have this sort of knowledge about the celebrity, you know, with the Grace Kelly dress, I felt like I knew the wedding dress because I was obsessed with it. And with Elizabeth Taylor, I had seen her movies as a kid, I knew, I, you know, she was still alive uh, when I was growing up. So I felt like I knew everything. Then I read my first biography and I realized I knew nothing. So in terms of this book, one of my favorite surprising facts is that the Krupp diamond was not actually an engagement ring. A lot of people think that Richard Burton gave it to her as an engagement ring, but no, it was a just because present. He gave it to her just because she loved jewelry. He would sometimes call these gifts happy, you know, I love you and it's Tuesday presents. And it's just, there's something so romantic about it and um, sexy and wonderful. And this was her favorite ring and she wore it um, just about every day. So I think that was one of the things, one of the first surprises that I learned about her. Um, but God, there's so many. And at the end of the book, I talk about Jane's sort of reference. At the end of the book, I go chapter by chapter talking about each um, each influence and how I wrote the chapter based on different things that I was sort of inspired by from Liz Taylor's life and movies. So there's plenty of plenty more surprises in there. <laughs> Just have to read to find out. Although I do love that ring one, and it is Tuesday, so I think we can all use a "I love you." It's Tuesday ring today. So <laughs> I hope someone out there gets one. <laughs> all right, let's see. Um, I'm loving this conversation so much. I love your book, Brenda. Um, if Elizabeth Taylor were here today, what would you like to ask her? And would it be about her diamonds? Oh, goodness. Well, you know, Elizabeth Taylor very famously um, used her jewelry uh, as playthings. She loved, there are reports that she would be in a hotel room or wherever she was living at the time and she would take all of her jewelry out and play with it like a child would play with dolls. She also very famously allowed people to try on her jewelry. And um, a maybe not well-known story is when she met Princess Margaret uh, soon after getting the crop, Princess Margaret turned to her and said, oh, is that the ring? And she sort of flashed her ring. In an interview, she said, after I got the crop, I became remarkably left-handed. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> so she said, is that the diamond? And Liz said something like, you know, isn't it great? And Princess Margaret looked at her and said, how vulgar. And so Elizabeth Taylor said, oh, would you like to try it on? So who can resist a 33.19 carat diamond? So of course she said yes. And once Princess Margaret had it on her hand, Elizabeth said, not so vulgar now, is it? <laughs> so I think if I met Elizabeth Taylor, I would ask her to try on that crop. And I, I, I just have to um, insert here that actually there is the most wonderful book that's coming out soon, um, which is or, which features Princess Margaret in the most glorious way, which is Mystique Island by Sarah McCoy. Um, and it comes out, I think, at the end of April or May. And I've just been lucky enough to get an early copy. And it's delicious. And it's it's another one that's sort of set in the 60s and, and all on Mystique. And it's just fabulous. And, and so... Anybody who, who likes, you know, the crown, you've got to get this Mystique Island. It's really a glorious read. I have to get a copy of that. <laughs> I will tell Sarah immediately. <laughs> she sends her love, by the way. She's really sorry that she can't be here. <sighs> okay. 
The cover is so beautiful. Did you have to review a lot of covers and how did the cover come about? Thank you. So a woman named Quinn Beating designs my covers. She did the cover for Grace Kelly and she did it for Liz Taylor. So I really wasn't worried about liking the cover because I knew that she would come up with another absolutely gorgeous cover. Uh, this was actually the first version that I saw. A lot of times with cover art, you'll sort of see one, reject it, it goes back and forth. But no, the second we saw this cover, we all sort of fell in love. I was sort of speechless when I saw it. I just thought it was so gorgeous. I remember my agent said something, she wanted a little more detail on the dress and you know, there were tiny little details here or there, but oh God, I just thought it was so stunning. So the first time I saw it, I fell in love with it. And then I was nervous because as Jane knows, sometimes you get a book cover and then they're like, surprise, here's a different one. <laughs> but I completely fell in love with it. I had nothing to do with it. I wish I could say I had any ideas at all. My ideas were all terrible. I said that the only good idea I had was that it should sort of match Grace Kelly. So they look like they sort of went together even though the books aren't related. Um, so that was a bad idea. I also sent them the famous Herb Ritz picture where Liz Taylor has her hair up in a towel and she has the ring like this. And all you see is her gorgeous eyes and the towel and the ring. And I said, you know, the cover should be something like this. And they were like, what do you mean? I was like, I don't know, I'm not the cover artist. <laughs> but that was sort of my, my, my contribution. So I had nothing to do with it. I take no credit. It was all Quinn and she does remarkable work. It's really funny, actually, how we sort of we have an idea of what we think we want. And and yet we are not designers. And and look, I've had some in my day, I've had some horrors thrown. I've had the unveiling of things that have just been like, oh, but um, when they get it right first time, it's that, you know, you get that sort of that thrill. And it, it's just it's extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a beautiful cover. Thank you. All right. I met both of you ladies at a book event on Long Island a few years ago, and you were both so gracious and charming. I am absolutely looking forward to reading both of your new books as I've read your previous ones. This is a tough question, but my question for each of you is, what is your favorite novel that you have written, if you have one? That is a tough one. That's sort of like being asked which child of yours is your favorite. I was going to say, I feel like that's kind of a similar question that we're going towards here. And Jane has more children than I do, and she has more books. So this one's going to be harder for Jane. So I'm going to handle it first while she thinks. You know, to me, the book I'm working on is always the best book I've ever written. I feel like with every book, I'm trying to get better, trying to do something different. So as of right now, I'm going to say this is my favorite book, and this is the best book I think I've written. But I bet when Audrey comes out in a year, I'll have a different story. <laughs> yeah. Jane, so I don't know you're going to answer this. <laughs> <laughs> How am I going to? Well, I, you know, for years, I, I, I never had one, but I had a couple. You know, I, I love the Beach House. I love the Sunshine Sisters. I love Tempting Fate. Um, I will say though that that Sister Stardust. Um, you know, Talita Getty. I don't know if you can see this, but this is this is actually a, a sketch that I did of her, which is from a very famous Patrick Litchfield photograph. And that's her on the rooftop of their palace in Marrakesh. And that's Paul Getty behind her. I first saw that picture when I was a teenager. And there's so little known about her. And she died at the age of 30, that she has been my obsession for my entire adult life and just wanting to know more. And there's something about, the expression in her eyes and there's a sadness and a mystery and of course now I know where that came from but I I didn't know before because there is so little known about her um that I have to say Sister Stardust is it feels like the the book of my life it feels like the the, the book of my career and I'm sure that I will write you know books that I love after this but this book has a piece, a very large piece of my heart. And I, I love her and I love that world. And, and so I was very careful. And also it, because it's historical fiction, I was very, very careful. You know, I, I, this is a, this is a love letter. I mean, it's a love letter to the sixties. 
it's a love letter to Marrakesh. Um, and it's, it's most of all, I think, a love letter to Talita Getty, who died too soon. Very nice. I love both those responses. <laughs> okay, Brenda, I am new to your books. Is there a book I should read first? First of all, thanks for being here. That's amazing. So yeah, I would start with Liz and then just go backwards. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, like I said, writers, you know, the book I'm working on now is always sort of my favorite. So I think that's my best. So I always want to start off with my best. Um, it's so tricky because most of my books are not related. Um, but yeah, Liz to me is the best one I've written. So start there. <laughs> and, and, and actually it, it is just you will not be able to put it down. I mean, it's really, it's just the perfect escapist read, um, but also with, with sort of some really serious messages. I love, I just need to say this. There are a couple of things that I really loved. I loved how you wrote about addiction, but I also loved that you wrote about the ands, that, that, that life isn't binary. It isn't black or white. It can be black and white. It can, you know, think that the ands, we have to exist in the ands. And I, I really love that message that, that goes through the book. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we are just hitting eight o'clock. So we unfortunately are gonna to have to wrap things up, but I wanna thank you both so much for being here tonight with us. I also want to remind everyone to purchase their copy of the Liz Taylor Ring. We do have signed book plates, well supplies last, so make sure to get your copy. We also sent links to pre-order Sister Stardust, so make sure you get a copy of both of these wonderful books. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, and thank you again, Brenda and Jean. Thank you for having us. Thank, thank you, Victoria, and thank you everybody for coming. <laughs> oh. Thanks, guys.